I thought I died. I was like, this must be heaven because I, I was able to breathe. Like, it's hard. It's hard for you to understand how I felt because breathing for you has always been second nature, kind of first nature kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was never. It was always something I had to remember to do or remember to concentrate on his breathing, right? But after my transplant, it was like, I honestly thought I went to heaven because I, I couldn't believe that I was able to breathe without, um, without having a cough or anything like that. Welcome to Living Transplant, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the transplant program at Toronto General Hospital and brings you open and honest conversations about the transplant experience. My name is Courtney, and I'm the communications specialist for the Center for Living Organ Donation. And my name is Brittany. I'm a bedside nurse in the Ajmira Transplant Center. Full disclosure, we are not physicians. No, and we are not here to give you medical advice. Think of us like your guides through the world of transplant as we know it. Whether transplant is your past, present, or future, your passion, or your curiosity, Living Transplant will show you the world of transplant like you've never seen it before. Our guest today is Kadeem Morgan. Kadeem was diagnosed with CF when he was about one years old, and now he's 23 years old. So, Kadeem, welcome, and thank you for coming. <coughs> hello, hello. <laughs> so, what is your connection to transplant? Well, my connection to transplant is having cystic fibrosis. I received my transplant back in 2017, ironically, Easter weekend. Right before my transplant, right before I got the call, I was already an inpatient at St. Michael's Hospital battling a really bad, bad infection or virus. What a concoction of the two. (laughs) And I was hospitalized for two months prior to getting the phone call. I got the phone call on Good Friday, and by Easter Sunday, I was on the operating table. Wow. Yeah, luckily, I was fortunate that I didn't have to wait too long to receive the phone call, because I, how should I put it? I was on life support pretty much before my transplant, and my doctors didn't think I was gonna make it to see a transplant. So from the period between signing the papers and the consent forms to actually get into surgery, I probably waited like three weeks max. And that's pretty much almost record time because the average is what, like six months to a couple of years, in fact, because obviously they have to find the perfect set of lungs for you, right? They can't just get anybody's lungs and then just toss them into you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. yeah, my connection to the transplant program is having cystic fibrosis and receiving a double lung transplant. Nice. So as I mentioned to you <coughs> at the beginning, before we started recording, I have no idea about, I have very basic knowledge of cystic fibrosis. Do you mind explaining what it is? Okay, so for sake of time, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease. And so it's considered a rare disease that primarily impacts the respiratory system. In order for someone to be diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, both the mother and father have to carry the CF gene. And even then, if both parents carry the CF gene, I think the percentage is like the chances of the kid getting cystic fibrosis is probably like 25%. You're right. The chances of people in color having cystic fibrosis is even lower. So like me personally and my younger brother were in a niche demographic already and then throw in cystic fibrosis, that's even more of a niche demographic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I should note that cystic fibrosis also affects your pancreas the lack of ability to produce enzymes to break down your food and whatnot. There's also CF-related diabetes, some people have cancer related to cystic fibrosis. It Cystic fibrosis is just like a huge concoction of things. It's like an umbrella term. Yeah, mm-hmm. pretty much. But essentially, what it like pathophysiologically, your lungs produce mucus normally. CF 
there's when you are when you have CF, you're missing a gene, um, or that gene is mutated, and it so that the mucus that your lungs normally produce is thicker. So essentially, your lungs just fill up with mucus, like thick mucus. Basically, you're drowning. Yes. In your own bodily fluids. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I see. Okay. It's too thick to get out. Mucus equals bad. Okay. <laughs> Which then <Got> it. <laughs> creates more problems for infection. Exactly. Right. Like lightly. Okay. So you mentioned it being really, I don't know if this we're getting here already, but uh, you mentioned C- CF being really rare in people of color. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I did some preliminary research. I think, what was it for? Because I looked up Asian patients and black patients yeah. were the first two that came up. So according to the CF Foundation in the States, the disease occurs in 1 in 2,500 to 3,500 white newborns. Cystic fibrosis is less common in other ethnic groups, affecting 1 in about 17,000 African Americans and 1 in 31,000 Asian Americans. Wow. Yeah. Just to get the picture of how rare, how rare it is yeah. for this to have happened absolutely so Kadeem other than you you mentioned your brother has CF as well yes he does okay so other than your brother have you met another black CF patient throughout my years of being part of CF programs and whatnot I probably met two people with cystic fibrosis who are black I also have a friend who is, he was born in Guatemala. She has cystic fibrosis as well. But besides those three people, mainly white people I know that have cystic fibrosis. Hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So how does it affect someone's life? That's a broad question. How does it affect, how has it affected your life? Cystic fibrosis? Yeah. See, the thing is, before my transplant, I never really, I like, I was never the one to plan around my cystic fibrosis. And what I mean by that is that I would never say no to going to an event or hanging out or doing anything possible because of CF. I wouldn't let CF discourage me towards doing things, right? Mm-hmm. Like, for example, I know a lot of my CF friends they can never ever go on a roller coaster at Wonderland mm. because, like, because of the air pressure from all the the rides and stuff. Me, on the other hand, I probably the first time I went to Wonderland, I went on Behemoth like five times in a row. <laughs> Call me crazy, uh, I was yeah. like, at at the end of each run, I was just like gasping for air, but I was like, nah, I can't, because all my friends wanted to do it, right? So yeah. I'm like, you know what? Toughen it out. Let's go do it again. Front cart, behemoth, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, I never really let CF run my life. Obviously, there's some things that I had to do in order to sustain my health. I had, I used to have like a five hour routine regimen every morning and every night before bed that consisted of taking a lot of drugs, <laughs> like pills and stuff, steroids, a lot of like inhaled antibiotics, stuff like like inhaled Ventolin or Palmazine or hypertonic saline through a nebulizer. Yeah, for this the took first... five hours every night. Sorry, I didn't mean to say five. I meant like I meant like four, three, four hours four. max. Okay, four hours. Four hours. Four hours, yeah. Yeah. Four hours a, to get yeah. ready for bed. Yeah, medication right? routine. My skincare yeah. routine's like forty, and I'm like. Geez. <laughs> no, I wish. Because, like, and I had to do it before school as well, which, yes. unfortunately, I lived far from my school. Right. I, I made things harder on myself because I originally lived in Scarborough, but then I moved to Pickering, mm-hmm. but I still attended my Scarborough schools. Mm-hmm. So that means I had to wake up even earlier <laughs> to do all my treatments yeah. and stuff before I even leave the house, right? Mm-hmm. But as far... That's for that, like, that's the only, that's probably the only thing about CF that made me, that made me, ha- that made me plan around what I needed to do. Obviously, if I had to be hospitalized for IV antibiotics, there's nothing I can really do then, right? Yeah. But mm-hmm. even when I was hospitalized, I was still, like, I was still trying to get all my homework done, try to do all these projects and stuff like that. I was just... 
I was a workhorse, and if I wasn't working, I felt like I was wasting time per se. So I never, I as much as much as I tried to near the, like closer to getting a transplant, I never let CF dictate what I was going to do that day. I was dictating what I was going to do that day, and CF was like left on the back burner. It's mm. pretty incredible. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, so obviously. I'm fully starting to wrap my head around it, but obviously CF affects your respiratory system. So the air pressure thing and then riding roller coasters, that makes perfect sense when you say it, but I never would have thought of that. No. Yeah, because like breathing for like the average person, just it's whatever, right? Yeah. For people with cystic fibrosis, like you have to fully be conscious of your breathing. You can't like miss a breath. You can't like accidentally hold your breath because that would just turn into a coffin fit, right? So, right. someone with cystic fibrosis is always consciously thinking about their next breath as opposed to someone else, someone that doesn't have any respiratory issues. Breathing just seems like whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, I guess just for the listeners and for myself, what are some kind of I guess, general rules or, or restrictions that they would tell you uh, when you have CF, things that you should avoid or that you can't do. <laughs> the list is long. long. List? Okay. It, it's a long list. And if I were to be completely honest, a lot of CF patients are rebels. Mm. So they don't always follow healthcare guidelines. It's hard, though. Uh, it's hard because, like, for example, say say you have cancer, right? And then you join a support group with people who have cancer. You could meet someone. You could go to lunch with them, like physically interact with them. Mm -hmm. But with cystic fibrosis, you can't interact with other cystic fibrosis patients in fears of passing any like dangerous virus or bug to your fellow CF. Or like, for example, say... Brittany, say you had CF, right? Mm -hmm. And I had CF. Mm -hmm. One of my viruses may be like a regular routine thing that my body's used to. But if said virus got transferred to you, high possibility it will kill you. Because your body doesn't know, recognize that virus. Your body never had that virus. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it would be life-threatening to you. So that's like one of the biggest restrictions CF patients have. Mm -hmm. There's also like constant like hygiene checks. Make sure you wash your hands with hand sanitizer everywhere you go. Every time you touch something in public. For the for like the more severe patients, they always wear a mask, even before this whole COVID thing. Mm -hmm. So basically, <laughs> basically all the precautions you take for like COVID or like just general diseases and whatnot that's basically the life of a cystic fibrosis patient that's like a normal thing yeah 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 they say <laughs> in the various cystic fibrosis groups they say cystic fibrosis patients are like taught to be doctors and nurses from a very young age yeah it's an interesting yeah. Way of putting it. I've never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is funny talking to transplant recipients and or candidates and immunocompromised people are already, you know, you ask them, Are you well scared aware. about COVID? Yeah. And they're like, Not really. I just <laughs> keep doing what I've been doing for yeah, a while. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The whole social distancing and stuff is nothing new really. It's just okay, I've been doing this my whole life. The only difference yeah. is it's like the whole world, world has is to shut get. down. Before, I, I, if anything, is easier now for us than before COVID because COVID, the whole world was still going around and we had to like carefully place ourselves and carefully figure out what we have to do without getting sick. Mm -hmm. But now that the world is closed, it's like whatever, we've been doing this all our lives. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is typical of CF patients, but like in a lot of ways, Right now, anyway, your disease seems, like, invisible. So oh, how yeah. would someone oh, know yeah. that they have to keep a distance from you to keep you safe? Honestly, I'll use my brother as an example. If you saw him, you wouldn't even know if he had cystic fibrosis. He, he doesn't get admitted. He doesn't really get sick. He doesn't take pancreatic enzymes, which is usually one of the main... Um, 
forms of treatment cystic fibrosis patients take. He doesn't have to do nebulizers. He's He looks like a normal 19-year-old kid or young man, right? Close to me when I was his age, I was coughing nonstop. Like, I probably, like, I... I would cough so much, I probably wouldn't even be able to do this talking with you guys because, like, I couldn't go five words without coughing. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I had to go through that for, like, a good 20 years of my life. It just became normal. But, yeah, sometimes it can be invisible if you're not if you're not fully of, aware of the person. Yeah. If I didn't cough a lot, people wouldn't have known I had cystic fibrosis. Yeah, I would have, I would have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Was your diagnosis prolonged due to the likelihood of you even having CF? Or like the the statistics of it being a, sti- like you being a statistical rarity, like do you think that prolonged, yeah. your, prolonged di- your diagnosis? Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Until I was born, obviously, well obviously, because I'm a, I'm of Caribbean descent, mm-hmm. Jamaica and Barbados, mm-hmm. respectively. And obviously, because of the history, there were white people in my ancestry, right? Mm-hmm. Because of slavery, plantations, of that mm-hmm. that's a fact. So on my dad's side, my great-great-great-grandfather was Irish. And on my grandmother's side, or my mom's side, my great-great-grandfather was half Scottish. Until then, my whole family didn't realize how many white Europeans we had in the family until we actually looked at our family tree. And unfortunately, those white family members are far down in my ancestry line. My brother and I were the lucky ones to catch cystic fibrosis. (laughs) Like, my parents were the lucky ones to both be carriers, right? Mm. But back, dating back to 96 when I was born, forget now being rare in people of color. Think about 96 in the 90s, right? Right. Doctors thought I had sickle cell anemia. They thought I had glorified asthma. They thought all my symptoms, I would just grow out of it and whatnot. Yeah, nothing. Wow, yeah. And it makes you wonder how many people are out there undiagnosed. Or, yeah, well, because yeah. a lot of people are carriers, but a lot don't of carriers. Know. I know this is more common, of course, with white European CF patients. I know some people that weren't even diagnosed till they were like thirty, because oh, okay. they never had flare-ups of whatever, right? Not even no respiratory problems, no pancreas problems, no GI problems, nothing. So, like, cystic fibrosis is weird because it's like there's no way of putting an umbrella over cystic fibrosis because it's almost like a case-by-case situation like my cf is different from another person's cf Mm -hmm. right so what might help another person may not help me because of the different genetic makeup i understand sorry i feel like i'm asking i just have so many questions but uh, how common is it for two siblings to to both have cf is that um it's 25% 25% chance. Yeah. Okay. It's a 25% chance that both parents will have a oh, right. child. And then, that, yeah. Yeah. So I'd say it's still very, it's just rare. It's like. Yeah. Cause I know a couple of people, a couple of friends with cystic fibrosis. They have the same mothers and fathers and their older or younger sibling doesn't have cystic fibrosis. Mm. But I have heard of, I've actually had a couple of patients that have had brothers or twins that have that are CF yeah twins or CF siblings I've heard of it a, only a couple times though it's yeah it's yeah. very rare it's rare yeah. it's rare it's very rare but like luckily if one child has CF if the mother plans to have another kid generally speaking the doctors are going to suspect they ha- the next kid will have CF mm-hmm. just for precaution right um Especially now, like, since they have, like, CF as part of the newborn screening as well. But just as a precaution, like they did with my brother because they knew I had CF. They planned for my brother to have CF, in which helped him in the long run. I was pretty much a guinea pig. (laughs) (laughs) Not that I'm I'm mad about that or anything. It is what it is, right? As long as I know my brother's good, he's healthy, and I'm part of that, the reason why, then I'm happy. (laughs) You know, because I I know what I've been through. I've been through 
a lot, and I don't know how I would react if my brother went through the same things I've gone through. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Scarborough. Scarborough team. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Scarborough. And what was it like growing up in Scarborough with CF and also being Afro-Canadian? <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, it's growing up in Scarborough, what, like... I, I think that it's, that's like enough explanation, but like, well, the thing is like, <laughs> <laughs> wait, I'm from, I'm from Victoria, BC, and I think our listeners are kind of spread out across the country. Yeah. So give us like a, a Scarborough vibe. What's Scarborough in a nutshell? <laughs> <Go> Scarborough <laughs> is the most, it's the most ghetto, but <laughs> upbeat place in Toronto. It's ghetto, but it's like, it sets itself at like such high standards. It's like it's it's hard to it's hard to uh, explain. Um, most part, you meet a real a, a good amount of different individuals from different classes, different social standards, and whatnot. It's a huge melting pot, pretty much. You never have one race or group stick to their own. Mm-hmm. Every click mm-hmm. you see, you have, you have like a fair amount of Asians, blacks, white. There's a lot of diversity. No one right. really discriminates. It's nice. Like, but for me though, when I grew up in Scarborough, I grew up in the one pocket of Scarborough that was just predominantly white. Okay. In elementary school, I kid you not, K to eight, I was the only black kid. Well, straight black. There was like Same. one girl. That was like mixed white, black, mm. biracial. But from K to eight, for the most part, I-, I was the only black kid. I was the token black kid, mm, pretty much. Too. So, as the token <laughs> black girl, it's <laughs> tough because, like, I'm already so different. I have to, like, I felt like I had to uphold certain standards because in order not to be um, stereotyped as a black individual, right? So I already have that social standard to uphold. And on top of that, I had cystic fibrosis. And the one thing that I did not want, and I tried my hardest, and I think I succeeded, but I did not want to be looked at or viewed as the sick child, right? I wanted to be normal. I wanted to be like my healthy counterparts, right? But Mm -hmm. yeah, life didn't grant me that. So did did your friends know that you had CF or you kept that pretty close to the vest? I had one friend, God rest her soul, her name's Christiana. She had cancer. She was like the first friend I considered family. She knew I had CF. Ironically, we met before kindergarten. We met in the atrium of Sick Kids Hospital. I don't know how or why we talked then, but we did. And then two weeks later, I go to kindergarten, first day of class, I see her. They're like, oh, you go to kindergarten? Yeah, so like she became my first like sister friend and whatnot. She knew I had CF. I usually kept the people who knew I had CF to a minimum, to like only my closest and best friends knew. Because mm-hmm. again, I didn't want to be stereotyped. I didn't want people to worry or like I didn't want to deal with people's ignorance both intentional and non-intentional you know yeah and like like, pity too who wants you don't want people's pity yeah yeah and like to be honest I was hospitalized a lot sometimes it got as bad as like three times a year and each hospitalization was like at least three weeks, right? So I didn't want people to talk amongst themselves saying, oh, I think Kareem's dying, blah, 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 whatever, right? Because yeah. honestly, being hospitalized the way I and the CF community views it is like a card getting a tune-up. Pretty much that's it, really. Other people won't understand that because they I've wouldn't know, that. right? I love that. I but love that, yeah. too. It's just... Um, it's like, I'm not sick, I'm just getting a tune-up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what what did you tell people when you were hospitalized or you just didn't say anything? I lied. Yeah. I just told them that I would, like, I would tell them I'm going on vacation, stuff like that. They probably thought you were the luckiest kid in the world. Probably. <laughs> on Honestly, vacation three I, times a I year. If I sold the lie, 
a lot of them probably thought that. Did you ever experience any bullying because of it? Not bullying, just ignorance. I coughed a lot, right? So people would be like, oh, Kareem can't do this. He coughs a lot, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. Funny story, actually. On that note, <laughs> in elementary school, we had like these little soccer leagues that me and my friends participated in. And one person was like, oh, he has CF. I don't think he should play. I don't think he should play forward. Put him as defense, right? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know what? Forget this. Let me just go play. I ended up scoring four goals for my team. We won. And, like, that was a huge milestone moment for me because wow. it was like, yes, I have CF, but it doesn't mean I can't do what other people can do, right? Yeah. It may take me a little longer. It might be a little more difficult, but, like... <laughs> the famous words of Justin Bieber, never say never, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so leading up to your transplant, did you always know that you were going to need a lung transplant? Well, my doctors at Sick Kids brought it up to me before I turned 18, mm -hmm. before I transferred to the adult program. In the back of my head, I always knew something like that were to happen. But then again, I believe I thought that I was invincible and I'm like, nah, that's not going to happen to me. I'm not that bad. Yeah, you're the exception. Yeah, yeah. I really like, and, and I think most of that was because of fear. Like I always like having control of my surroundings and whatnot. Having a transplant, I give other people control over my life. Right? All I'm doing there is laying on a table getting sliced and diced, right? <laughs> And I think another fear was being put to sleep and not waking up again. Because, like, no one wants to have a serious surgery, right? No one, no one's willing to sign papers for um, surgeons to cut them up. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah that I was... In the back of my head, I knew it was going to be a reality. But I tried to, like, pass it off. Mm hmm Yeah. Was your double lung transplant your first major surgery? Yeah. Yeah. That is scary. It, yeah. it really is. Yeah, that's, that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It was, but honestly, when I had my transplant, I wasn't too worried because I was tired of being sick or having lung problems. Yeah. So, Kareem, <clears throat> not a lot of your friends, like, knew that you had CF, and only, only told, like, a couple of people. Yeah. Why is that? And when did you become so open about this? Believe it or not, right before my surgery, I was just tired of keeping up my lies. Because I'm like, we're talking about 20 years secrets. You know how much energy that takes? Keeping up one lie for a week mm -hmm. is a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Keeping up a lie for 20 years? Jeez, like now that I'm, <laughs> I'm rubbing my head wondering how I did it. Mm. But like the reason why I did it is mainly because I signed the papers to have a double lung transplant at a time where I was really invested in my music career and school and whatnot. And I was very, very social. Like I was talking to everyone and anyone. So like, I thought about it, about the whole lung transplant process. I would have to go ghost for like three months. Yeah. Right? And if I go ghost for three months, people are going to start questioning where where the hell is Kadeem? What's happening? Right? Yeah. And that's bad for business, pretty much, right? So I was like, I can't just go ghost for three months and not have anything to show for it. So I don't know how... I don't know what made me, but my first, I, I call it breakout, was I made a post on Facebook saying, oh, I've had cystic fibrosis for 20 years, I'm getting a double lung transplant. And after that, the weight of the world just left my shoulders. It, it felt really good. It, it, was, it felt like... I never knew I had such an elephant on my back. It felt so good just to let everything out. And like, nothing was a secret anymore. Yeah, because of the transplant, that's why I'm so open about everything. Yeah, and it's it, pretty amazing. And honestly, when I tell my story, if I'm not open, it just leaves plot holes and even more questions. So why not just 
tell it like it is, right? For sure. I mean, we really need to start bringing tissues, Britt. We're <laughs> 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 this keeps happening to us. But uh, yeah, I mean, like already it's, you know, it must be hard to navigate the world feeling a little bit different than everyone else. And then on top of that, trying to like cover it up with all these lies, like you said, expending so much energy just to pretend that you're different than how you are. That must be really hard. I'm really glad you're you're so, comfortable being open now. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, being different was a huge factor throughout my whole childhood, pretty much. I wanted to be quote unquote normal, whatever normal <laughs> is, right? Yeah. I just wanted to be like my friends. I wanted to do things like my friends did, but I couldn't. I had to find alternate ways to do what my friends did. Mm -hmm. Most of them worked. Most of them were kind of, I guess, my parents would say stupid and reckless, but at the mm -hmm. time I was a kid, right? All I wanted to do was be a kid, but it's commonly said in the CF communities that patients with cystic fibrosis we grow up 10 times faster than your average human being. We mature by the time we're like 10, right? Mm. <laughs> by the time I was 10, not even, by the time I was eight, my parents felt comfortable with leaving me in the hospital to undergo IV antibiotics. They trusted me to tell them everything the doctor said. This That's is insane. eight years old. And honestly, by 10 years old, I already knew how to work the whole IV pump machine, stuff like that, the G-tube feeding machine, whatever. Been if, teaching my patients that like every day, <laughs> like, every single day. Yeah, no, I had that down pack. Kadeem, Kadeem, how did we meet? <laughs> <laughs> so since my whole life I've been back and forth through hospitals. Mm -hmm. That means a lot of IV antibiotics and all those goody drugs. Like, I have no means whatsoever. We met because no one else could start an IV on me. No one else could get blood from me. And I mean, I've heard of right I've heard of Britt's IV skills, so it's nice yeah. to have that confirmed. I yeah, <laughs> she she came in. She came into my room. I'm like, you know what? Good Pick luck. your poison. Good luck. You literally Whatever. said good luck. I'm yeah. Like, okay. And she was like, no, no, don't worry. I'm good. I'm like, oh, that's what everyone says, right? <laughs> and then she spent time looking, looking, whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever. Hurry up. I <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, all right, I'm ready. I'm like, go ahead. And I think she said something like, "How? why are you so calm? I'm like... Just go do it. You're probably going to miss it. And she actually got it. I'm like, holy. <laughs> I was like, I need your number just in case <laughs> this ever happens again. Because it's been a long, long time since someone got an IV to start on me in one poke. Yeah, it was like. Nice job, Brett. Right, yeah. AC. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> Like, oh, I didn't even see that one. Okay, are you ready for what might be a super dumb question? But as someone who doesn't have a medical background, since you had your transplant and CF is in your lungs, do you still have CF? Yes, because it's a genetic disease. It's in my okay. genes. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I don't think it was a dumb question, Courtney. Okay. Okay. No, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people ask okay, okay. I'm, like, I'm, I'm like, is this a dumb question? But... Do you still have CF? <laughs> but yeah, it makes sense because it yeah. is genetic, right? right. Okay. So, but does the lung transplant, like, this is a dumb question, but <laughs> in terms of the lungs and the mucus buildup, does it get rid of that? Yeah. It basically, for lack of better wording, like, just so you could understand it right. mm -hmm. to a full extent, the transplant cured the lung aspect of cystic fibrosis. Right. Cystic fibrosis still affects my GI system and pancreas, thus needing pancreatic enzymes every time I have a meal and stuff like that. That CF is still there, but the lung CF is not. So what are some ways that you've ever needed to advocate for yourself, for your health, for yourself, or your parents? Do you know what I mean? I never really had to advocate for myself, per se. 
I know people who don't really have faith in the healthcare system. Given their history, I understand. But for me, I never had to advocate. All my doctors, all my nurses were like amazing. From sick kids, from sick kids to St. Mike's to Toronto Gen, everyone just listened. Everyone was just attentive. I never had any problems with doctors or nurses not understanding how I felt or what I needed to be, what I needed to get done in terms of my cystic fibrosis, right? So I'm extremely grateful for that because I know people who weren't as lucky as me Mm -hmm. to have those kind of doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome to hear because yeah, there's definitely a lot of mistrust and rightfully so given a lot of historical atrocities that have been committed so that's that's really good to hear that you've never had a, a bad experience just, like that yeah. yeah yeah my healthcare team was pretty much my second family that's awesome like honestly and truthfully speaking so your transplant in 2017 did you get transplanted on your first call or how many times were you called in first call first try got everything done. Yeah. yeah well like i said i was extremely lucky oh, yeah. i only had to wait like three weeks that's awesome to mm-hmm. be called what are some of the things that have changed for you after transplant? Like positive <laughs> or negative? Big question again, but <laughs> what are some like big things that have really impacted your life from having had a transplant? To be honest, like first things first, I am extremely grateful that I have gotten a transplant because if I didn't, I'm 100% sure I wouldn't be here right now talking to you. Positive changes. I don't cough a lot. It's a huge change. Um, Goals are just easier to attain. Like any type of goals, maybe physical, mental goals about work, school, Mm. is just easier to maintain or easier to achieve just because I'm not in the hospital as much as I used to be. I'm not always sick and catching viruses and colds like that. Mm. So that's a positive which is the biggest positive is being alive, right? You don't have to struggle to live. Everything, living feels natural after a transplant, right? Did you have to learn how to breathe again? No. Funny story, actually. When I, <clears throat> when I first gained consciousness after uh, my surgery, I was still all hooked up to IVs, chest tubes, different monitors. I even still had a breathing tube down my throat. But when I woke up, I kid you not, I was trying to talk. And I thought my parents and my nurses could understand what I was saying. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't. (laughs) And it got to the point where one of my nurses told me I needed to shut up or she was going to put me to sleep. Because if I tried to talk over the tube, it could damage your throat Yeah, and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, shoot, I better shut up. But (laughs) (laughs) But, like, being able to talk without coughing or feeling the sensation of coughing was like so foreign to me those first like week that first like week was it like was it like unbelievable i thought i died okay i thought i died i was like this must be heaven because i i was able to breathe like it's hard it's hard for you to understand how i felt because breathing for you has always been second nature kind of first nature kind of thing Mm-hmm. But for me, it was never, it was always something I had to remember to do or remember to concentrate on this breathing, right? But after my transplant, it was like, I honestly thought I went to heaven because <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that I was able to breathe without com- um, without having a cough or anything like that. Yeah, wild. Have you ever written to or considered writing to your donor's family? I have written to them, but I never sent them anything. Like, it was more so a letter for me, mm. but addressed to them or whatnot. Yeah, that's, I guess that's one of the negative things to come out of having a transplant. It's just survivor's guilt, knowing someone died so you can live, right? That's That's one of the negatives about Having a transplant, the possible effects of depression and anxiety, survivor's guilt. Mm-hmm. It's a huge thing. It, it, unfortunately, it's not as talked about. 
when you're recovering, but it's a huge, it plays a huge factor in your recovery and life after transplant. Was that like immediate that you felt like that? Or was it? No, like... it was after all the hype yeah. died down. Yeah. That's when, it, like, after, for me, it happened after my birthday, my 21st birthday. Um, around then, that's when I started feeling the lows after transplant. Because, yeah, just survivor's guilt and not believing I'm where I am at the moment because someone died. Mm-hmm. It's a thought that still runs through my head sometimes. Yeah, I was going to ask, how do you cope with it now? Or is it still, when it creeps up on you, is it still just as heavy as it was then? Yeah, it's still heavy, but the way I cope with it is that, I put it this way, I treat my body like a temple, and the best way for me to say thank you is to live every day. That's how I cope with it. Yeah, it's like, so perfect. not putting these lungs to waste, you know? Yeah. I work with a lot of patients and obviously I've worked in transplant for years, but we never get a moment to like really think about those things. So yeah. it's yeah. really, it's, after all the hype is, you really. I had a friend, his name's Matt, God rest his soul. It's harder to see other CF patients go through the same things you go through, Mm -hmm. but they never get to see a transplant because they unfortunately pass away. And that's part of survivor's guilt, right? Wondering why, if I survived, how come my friend couldn't, right? Yeah. That kind of stuff. And it's something that you think about. You try not to think about it, but at the same time, it's like, it's your friend, right? I've never had problems with, like, depression or anxiety before my transplant after my transplant that's when it started like kicking in but you just answered one of the questions i was going to ask you your mental health when you were younger was it was fun it was great i was egotistical i was like (laughs) always bigging myself up in every way yeah shape or form did your parents have a part in that did they always feed you with Good positive. Like... No. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was over exaggerated. Sorry, mom and dad. I love you guys <laughs> lots. Well, I but um, <laughs> <laughs> my parents. Well, my dad. <laughs> when I was younger, he was like the stereotypical Jamaican, and was like always like tough love with mm-hmm. him. And stuff like that. He was very, very tough love oriented dad. Like for a while, I almost like completely hated him because he was so tough. But now that I'm older, thinking back, I needed him to show me that tough love mm-hmm. in order to be the man I am today. My discipline and my willingness to see things through to the end, I owe to my dad. As much as I may have pissed him off or teased him as a kid, he really, yeah, I, I it was true, true tough love. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how else to explain it. And your mom? My mom, she was kind of the same in a sense, mm-hmm. but obviously sometimes the mothers are more affectionate with their mm-hmm. kids, mm-hmm. and since I was her firstborn, right? My mom wasn't as tough love. But she did inherit some of those personality traits from my dad just naturally Mm -hmm. and whatnot. My mom was a lot kinder in that sense. (laughs) Like, for example, if I had any problems, I'd probably go to my mom before my dad. (laughs) But, like, yeah. So, like, they're kind of polar opposites. But at the same time, my mom did inherit some of that tough love. And plus, if anything, I knew more about CF than they did because I had it. Yeah. Right? They didn't really, they only knew what they were told, right? And when you're told something, you draw your own conclusions. You don't actually feel it because, like, they didn't, they didn't, they just didn't understand cystic fibrosis. And how could they, right? They didn't understand the symptoms. So every time they thought I was doing something wrong or I wasn't taking care of myself adequately, but in reality, it was just cystic fibrosis, but they didn't know that, right? How could they if they didn't know how to, how it okay. felt? And after the transplant, your mental health kind of I was, changed? Yeah, yeah. And were your, how were your parents after that? Or your support system, really? Whoever yeah. that may be. 
my parents, they're still the tough love kind of parents, but at the same time, they're more open to listening and understanding as well. Mm-hmm. My support system is great, even though I have like only like five or six friends that I really talk to, mm-hmm. or, or like people outside of my immediate family. Mm-hmm. I love them to death. <laughs> they look out for me, and I, I love them to death for that. <laughs> Essentially, they're my other family. So in the future, where do you see yourself? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I always wanted to be a professional musician, make millions, you know, the glams and glitz of life. (laughs) I never knew I'd be where I am today. Like, I'm advocating for cystic fibrosis, uh, advocating for the treatments, supports for families. I never thought I'd be doing that. I still want to become a social worker, a music therapist for youth and children with rare diseases because I know how difficult it could be for someone with a rare disease or any child with mental problems or health problems. When I know how hard it is for them to advocate for themselves or explain how they feel because a lot of, like, I'm not discrediting, like, doctors or whatnot obviously because i've had the best doctors in my life but they only know the science right you don't really understand something fully until you've actually experienced it right Mm -hmm. i feel like that's where i could use my expertise to help because i've experienced it Mm -hmm. i experienced not being able to voice what's wrong with me and whatnot that kind of stuff or having troubles dictating how i felt and stuff like that so I want to try to be a music therapist and a child and youth social worker. That's awesome. That's the plans for the future. That's really exciting. Yeah. So, Kadeem. Yo, yo. (laughs) I have a question. What do you look for in a partner? Um, honestly, just just someone who's not close-minded to things, right? I wouldn't consider myself high-maintenance. I'm really laid back. I go with the flow. You seem like that. I don't get angry. Like, it really takes a lot for me to get angry. So, yeah, someone who is understanding, open-minded. Yeah, that's really it. I don't really have any specifications like that obviously they can't smoke yeah Um, (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. i think that's for lots of people even if you don't have yeah yeah yeah, right can't Can't be a smoker Mm yeah and yeah just someone who is really open-minded and just because like i could also say i want someone who's as mature as me but i understand that i'm a lot more mature than people expect because of everything i've been through and i think that's like shooting for the stars, pretty much. Because not everyone has been through a lot in such a short span of their life, right? Mm-hmm. I remember you said earlier that CF patients are reckless or um, rebellious. Yeah. So is that something that you see often? Or is that is, is that like a natural connection between two CF people? Well, you have to understand that humans are social creatures, right? Right. We're not supposed to be confined. And like, if I tell you not to do something, you're more than likely going to do that. So telling a CF patient you can't hang out with another CF patient, boom. Yeah. I know plenty of CF patients who are best friends and they've like physically interacted and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I did once too, I'm not going to lie. It was probably the best time I had with a friend ever up to this day because... Like, CF patients, we're one and one the same. Pretty much we all go through the same treatments, the same experiences. They're like the sibling God never gave you, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Yeah. That's the hardest part, would you say, with having CF? Is that you just naturally want to connect with somebody because you've been through all the same things and... You want to be able to just leech on to something or someone that can say, yeah, like, this is what happened to me. And 
this is how I dealt with it. Thankfully, we live in a social and a technological world. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, like you just you just want to leech onto something or somebody that and you just naturally connect. So it's exactly like, hard to just be like, nope. <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Like, yeah, like everyone has their support, group, different support groups, right? But like with the CF community, everybody's so close, but yet still so far so apart. Far, right. Mm -hmm. Like so, so far. Mm hmm. One final question for you. What's something you would tell someone who's struggling to accept the reality of their CF diagnosis? Or transplant. Or transplant, yeah. It's going to sound so cliche, but I would say you're not alone. And I mean that to its fullest extent. I know how it feels to think that you're the special occasion. You're the only one that this is all happening to, which is not true at all. There's always someone who's been through the same thing, or if not worse. I wish I knew that before my transplant, while growing up with CF. I wish I knew that people out there, besides my brother, felt the same things I felt, went through the same things I went through. If I had that, I probably would have been more open about my cystic fibrosis. But the main point is, my situation, no one looked like me, no one acted like me, so I felt very alone. But thank God, now in the 21st century, we're able to put ourselves in different support groups and stuff like that. When I was growing up, I think we only had MySpace. And like, <laughs> and that's not like the safest place for kids, right? Yeah, you're not alone. There are support groups out there. There are people out there who are willing to talk and to share their experiences with you and whatnot. So, Kidding, did it ever create some form of tension between you and your brother? No, not really. I knew that I went through everything I ha went through because in order to like help him. Yeah. Uh, like Amazing. very, very low key, I am jealous of his health situation because he's a lot healthier than I've ever been. And especially at that age. But other than that, I'm just grateful that because of me, he's able to live like that. The roles could have easily been reversed. It could have been me, the younger sibling, and him being the sicker older sibling, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm just glad that he didn't have to go through even merely half the things I went through, right? Yeah, so it just, it, it doesn't create any tension. It humbles me. He's, yeah, he's great. <laughs> really and truly, by you speaking out so confidently and comfortably about your experience with CF and transplant, I know for a fact that it at least affect someone else's life just being able to hear that someone else went through a similar thing so on that behalf thank you for coming and <laughs> saying for in speaking out just hearing somebody has gone through something similar to you especially when it's so silent and so secretive and so scary even ha hearing somebody go through the same thing it doesn't make it better but it just it just helps a, a bit it plays a, it's like a mental game. It just knowing someone feels and been through the things you've been through. It it feels good to relate to something, right? Empathy. Yeah, empathy. Empathy. You're, you're not alone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's... that that in itself is very beneficial for healthcare. Yeah, uh, like absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Thank you so much. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Living Transplant. If you have questions or suggestions for future episodes, email us at livingorgandonation at uhn.ca. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review Living Transplant on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow us at GiveLifeUHN on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time.